Shalom and welcome to Temple Talk from Jerusalem, Israel, the Temple Institute. Rabbi Chaim Richman with me in the studio. Yitzchak Ruvain, today is the third day of the last month of the year 5775, the month of Elul. It's August 18th, 2015, this Shabbat, Parshat Shoftim. We have begun the month of Elul. It's a very special remarkable month it is like um, a time to put the brakes on and to take spiritual stock of everything of our of our aspirations of our goals of the past year of our hopes for for what we can achieve in all of our relationships and it's a month that precedes the time of judgment the awesome high holy days of the month of Tishrei Rosh Hashanah the new year and Yom Kippur and as such, this entire month is really given over to introspection, to thoughts of repentance, to spiritual preparation. And every day during this month of Elul, we sound the shofar in preparation for getting our hearts lubricated and open and ready for the sincere spiritual work that we have to do. Of course, the actual biblically mandated aspect of the service of Rosh Hashanah that's coming up next month is to sound the shofar. And this month, we also sound the shofar. It's kind of like a, an extra aspect of our service in preparation for Rosh Hashanah getting ready. And on Temple Talk, we have also traditionally always sounded the shofar on every Elul edition of Temple Talk for the benefit of our listeners since the sound of the shofar has such an awesome spiritual power to wake us from our slumber and remind us of the fact that there's only one goal to life and that is to become closer and closer to God, to come closer and closer to the people whom we want to be and to break the barriers that hold us back from our own self-knowledge self-awareness and that hold us back from making progress on the road to spiritual perfection. Shofar blower. Have I ever told you that? Oh, go on now. Oh, now, yeah. of course, also, the whole idea Excellent. of the month of Elul is that we are trying to really, like I said, put the brakes on, grab hold of ourselves, take a, take a look at ourselves, and try to get right with all the things that we know need strengthening, need work in, in our lives, in our relationships. It's awesome. And there's a lot of things that we do during this month of Elul that are designed to make us kind of um, stop short and, and reassess. And we also try to um, strengthen the areas that need to be improved and actually <clears throat> take upon ourselves extras, extra stringencies, extra things that we know we've been lacking in not because we're trying to put one over on God, not because we're trying to act like, oh, all of a sudden now we're so religious, we're, we're, uh, we're, not, we're not fooling anybody, but because we actually want to be better people. Who doesn't want to be better and improve? And what we do during this month will have a tremendous influence on the rest of the year, or the coming year. Everything goes, goes after how we um, prepare ourselves during this month. And one of the things also that we that we do during this month. One of the customs of the month of Elul is that every day, twice a day, in the morning and in the evening, we recite Psalm 27. Psalm 27 is very, very special. And it's a Psalm of David. Hashem, God, is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Hashem is my life's strength. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers approach me to devour my flesh, my tormentors and my foes against me, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army would besiege me, my heart would not fear. Though war would rise against me, in this 
I trust. One thing I asked of Hashem that shall I seek, that shall I seek. Would that I dwell in the house of God all the days of my life to behold the sweetness of Hashem and to compliment His sanctuary. You could take a look at chapter 27 in the book of Psalms. It actually has 14 verses. But one of the themes in this psalm is this feeling of um, um, being pursued by, by a tormentor, being, being uh, pursued, and this battle. And the interesting thing about the psalm is that it's about an inner conflict. It's not about a, a, an actual physical um, enemy or tormentor or um, uh, antagonist. It is David expressing the feeling of um, his, his inner conflicts with himself. And that is the greatest battle of all. And that uh, level of spiritual uh, honesty and self-awareness and um, the desire to, to change is exactly what one of the major themes of this month of Elul is all about. And one of the interesting things about this month also is the Torah portions that always fall out during this month of Elul. Um, here in the book of Devarim, of Deuteronomy, the names of the Torah portions are very allegorically connected to these themes of repentance and preparation and everything that goes hand in hand with the month of Elul. So what is the order, right? Beginning with last week. The order of the Torah portions in the, that fall out in the month of Elul are Re'e, Shuftim, which is this week's, Ki Tetze, Ki Tavo, and Nitzavim. And that is very, very interesting because Re'e, Si, right? That was last week's Torah portion where I basically began by, by Moshe saying, Si, I have placed before you today a blessing and a curse. And Elul is all about seeing the truth and the, and the inner dimension of where we're at and taking stock. Shoftim, this week's Torah portion that we're reading this Shabbat, begins with the idea of appointing judges and officers. Judges and officers shall you appoint in all your cities, which Hashem your God gives you for your tribes, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. And this whole first number of verses is all about justice. And in fact, justice is a major theme of this parsha, which is replete with very, very interesting commandments as well. Many commandments are found in this week's Torah portion. But also the whole idea of, of this period that we're in now, Elul leading to Tishrei, it's all about justice. It's all about the scales of justice. Tishrei itself, the constellation of the, of the month of Tishrei is the scales. It's all about the, the judgment of the High Holy Days. And Elul is the vestibule that leads into that. But interestingly, um, some of the great rabbis have always interpreted this verse, the first verse of this week's Torah portion, which is in Deuteronomy 16 and verse 18. They've always interpreted it allegorically regarding what we're talking about, the spiritual work of Elo, where it says, Shoftim v'shotrim titen lecha b'chol she'arecha appoints judges and officers in all your gates. And so they say it's referring to like your own gates. Your gates basically are your eyes, your ears, your nostrils, your mouth. Those are your gates. And you need to really be aware and very vigilant against um, things happening at your own gates that you have to have control over. You have to appoint watchmen over your gates and be careful what you say and be careful what comes out of your mouth and be careful what you hear and be careful how you express yourself and be careful about your thoughts and be careful how you act. So that's Re'e Shoftim. And then, of course, Parshat Ki when you go out against your enemy in battle, and your enemy, of course, is, you guessed it, is yourself, your own propensity for evil, your own evil inclination. Again, everything here is about our own worst enemy, which is the side of ourselves that is out of control. Ki is the next Torah portion, when you come into the land. That's like already... God willing, when we are successful in this battle and we come into the land, Nitzavim 
you are all standing today before the Lord your God. So the names of these Torah portions are kind of like hints or allusions to, the, to a spiritual progression and process that should hopefully be taking place within the hearts and souls and minds of all of us during this month as we prepare ourselves for the great and awesome time of Rosh Hashanah, the time of judgment. But besides being allegorical, of course, it's also real. It's also very practical. Um, for example, we began by talking about this week's Torah portion, Parshat Shoftim, begins with the idea of the establishment of just courts. Just courts, right? Justice. Judges and officers shall you appoint in all your cities which Hashem your God gives you for your tribes, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not pervert judgment. You shall not respect someone's presence. You shall not accept a bribe, for the bribe will blind the eyes of the wise and make just words crooked. Righteousness and righteousness shall you pursue, so that you will live and possess the land that Hashem your God gives you. So this is very much emphasizing the theme of justice and says quite specifically that you, you must pursue righteousness so that you will live and possess the land that Hashem your God gives you. But in general, as far as all humanity is concerned, righteousness is the basic foundation of creation. So a very dear friend this week asked me a question, <clears throat> and I want to paraphrase it. I want to paraphrase this, this um, comment that I received from, from a very dear friend. Speaking about this week's Torah portion, which talks about the importance of judges and law enforcement and justice, and realizing, of course, that the, the concept of setting up courts of justice is a universal law. You know, there are seven universal Noahide laws that are, that are um, uh, obligatory upon all humanity, according to Torah. And the seventh Noahide law, as everybody knows, is setting up courts of justice. Now, if, uh, if God expects us to behave and keep the commandments and, and try to be holy, and um, we're supposed to be refraining from the things that we shouldn't do, there wouldn't be any need for judges and courts of justice. And therefore, and therefore does it, it, he says, it doesn't seem right to think that God would set expectations so high that he knew that we couldn't live up to those expectations, so he gave us ways to deal with, with each other in light of our inability to meet his expectations. In other words, isn't that saying like he doesn't really expect us to succeed? Or is this a way that he demonstrates that he allows us to have free will? And as a question is asking is, if we're supposed to be just, then why do we have to establish courts of justice? So is that about our having free will, or is it about Hashem realizing in advance that we're all going to mess things up? So here's what I would like to say about that. I think it's a very excellent point. And, and here's the thing on the backdrop of this week's Torah portion, the month of Elul, preparation for Tishrei. You know, the concept of justice is so huge, it is basically the building block of uh, creation. And it's what Hashem loves the most. And I don't think it's, I don't think it's um, something to um, consider lightly, the fact that we have a tradition that the rabbis teach us that when God originally created the world, He created it solely with the attribute of justice. Now here's what the Midrash says, and it's, very, it's a very um, enigmatic teaching because obviously it means things on many deep levels because God doesn't change his mind. God doesn't need a plan B. But here's what the Midrash says, and it's a lesson for us to learn. He created the world originally with the attribute of justice and seeing that it would not stand in that, that it was seeing that it would not survive, he tempered in the attribute of mercy as well so that ultimately creation is a balance of an admixture of justice tempered with mercy. But the first thought, as it were, that God had to create the world was, was only, only with justice. So my answer to my friend is that, well, justice is the basis of everything, and therefore there can't be a world without a system of justice. And that's why I think Hashem commands us to have this, these courts and to, and, to, and to pursue justice, not because He's setting us up for failure or knows that we'll fail, but because it is impossible to have a world without justice, and ultimately, this is the human condition. Yeah, there is free will. But if it says pursue, pursue justice, then that commandment is you have to pursue justice. You can't just 
it's just justice isn't just there you have to pursue justice that's what it sounds like that's saying to us actively you mean actively yes and so there is a mitzvah to be just and to be righteous but there's also a mitzvah to pursue that i'm just throwing that out there and it's not always easy it's not always easy so so but what, what i hope that I'm, I'm i'm you know succeeding in in um postulating and, and in, and in um, offering uh, some sort of answer to the question about, w about why we have this commandment. We have this commandment because, because not only will everything fall apart without it, but it will anyway. And it's up to us, like you say, the, uh, God actually gave us a positive commandment to pursue it all the time. That's the human condition to the extent that, and here it's like, I'm ready to just stop the broadcast after this. This is like so powerful. This is like, there's nothing else to say. I won't, but I'm just saying, I won't stop it, but I'm saying after the following verse, there's nothing else to say about this topic, even though we will find more things to say. Mm. And the verse is in Ecclesiastes, the great, the great scroll of Kohelet, written by King Solomon. And the verse says, furthermore, and it's actually in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 16, furthermore, I have observed beneath the sun, in the place of justice, there is wickedness. And in the place of righteousness, there is wickedness. I mused, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for everything and for every deed there. So we have these words, which are pretty profound, and that is, Mekom ha-mishpat shama ha-resha. In the very place of justice, there is wickedness. Yitzhak Ruven is already smiling, because <laughs> he knows that uh, when I say these words, I am just thinking about so many examples of the corruption of justice, of the perversion of justice, coming from maybe the highest courts of the land, of any land, how King Solomon in his tremendous prophetic revelation and divine wisdom was able to see that even in the place of institutionalized justice, or especially in the place of institutionalized mm -hmm. justice, that's the place where wickedness resides. So there's so much work to do in this world as far as fulfilling the commandment in this week's Torah portion of pursuing, pursuing justice. Righteousness, righteousness you shall pursue. And that's the answer to the question that was posed. This is a lifetime of work. You know, now what's really interesting I find about this topic of justice, it's so important and it's like everything to us. You know, there's a, there's a, a system that, that uh, Torah tradition has called the Sanhedrin, which is the ultimate body of wisdom and justice. And one of the chief tasks of the Sanhedrin is to pursue justice uh, with compassion and to rescue those that have been, that have been um, strangled, as it were, by, by this perversion of justice. Now what's really interesting is that as soon as Rosh Hashanah arrives, the first day of the month of Tishrei, Traditionally, there are certain changes that we make to the daily prayers. Um, and in those changes that we make to the daily prayers during the 10 days of repentance, we refer exclusively to God as the King. And we refer very often in our daily prayers during that particular period of time between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, which is the time that is totally saturated in repentance, we refer to His attribute of justice. Because that is really the ruling attribute in, at that time. But every single day, during the Shmona Asrei, during the 18 prayer, the 18 blessing prayer that we say three times a day, there is a paragraph that we read every single day as follows. And there is a slight change there also that we make during that special period. But every day, like this morning, here's what we said. We said, Hashiva Shavtena Kari Shona. We ask Hashem, please return our judges as, of, as it was in the beginning. V'yoatzenu kivatchila and those that give us proper counsel as in, as in the beginning, and remove from us grief and suffering. And please reign over us, you God, our, our, uh, you God, quickly reign over us alone with kindness and with mercy and justify us with justice and with, uh, with, with 
with, with, with righteousness and with justice. Blessed are you, Hashem, the king who loves righteousness and justice. What do I want to point out? I want to point out that's really interesting is that of, of all of the prayers of the Shmona Asri, all of the different paragraphs of the 18 blessings that we say every day, which form a veritable encyclopedia of the human experience, every up and down, every need and, and aspiration of, of what it means to be a human being, we beseech God for those things in our daily prayers. But this is the only paragraph in which we say words like this, where we say, and please remove from us suffering and anguish. And in what paragraph do we find those words on a daily basis? In the paragraph where we say, Hashem, please restore to us our shoftim, our judges, as uh, uh, our proper judges and our proper counselors as in the days of old, and remove from us anguish and suffering, meaning that what this is, this b brilliant insight that, 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 that our tradition is making in this prayer is that there's no greater anguish and suffering than feeling that justice is being perverted. When we're asking Hashem for, to return our judges, that's when we're asking for that, please, and please remove from, from me anguish and suffering, because my anguish and suffering is coming from the fact that it's like I'm in one of those movies and like I'm banging against like a wall and, and it's in slow motion, you know, and, and I'm screaming and no sound is coming out because there's no one listening. Because from the highest office of the land, there is a conspiracy um, where justice is being um, perverted. And that's why. In this Torah portion, there is such an emphasis on justice and on establishing courts of justice. And that's why the, the vision of Torah that we have been seeing consistently is of the Jewish people coming into the land of Israel and establishing a just society, because that is the foundation of everything. And there's so many examples of this that we see around us every day of, of uh, justice being perverted and of the wrong messages being given. And that's exactly why we're in the situation that we're in, because of the false god of political correctness, which has uh, blinded justice completely to the extent that we are all at the mercy of this tremendous idolatrous need to just say, oh, everything is okay, uh, but it really isn't at, at all. It could be, and it will be, and it should be, so stay with us. We'll be right back in Temple Talk. Talk today, third day of the month of Elul, 5775, 18th day of August uh, 2015. And uh, a rabbi has been talking exclusively about Elul, about uh, the time of uh, taking stock, doing a little soul searching, trying to uh, uh, be account accountable, having accountability for ourselves, our actions, our thoughts, our deeds, and of course the never-ending quest to improve ourselves and be better people and draw closer to God, all in preparation and leading up to the new year, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, what's known as the High Holy Days or the Days of Awe. And of course it's this intense period of introspection and tshuva, uh, uh, well, how do we translate that as uh, We translate it as repentance, but it's, it doesn't really work completely, the, the English word so repentance. It's stock taking. Repentance doesn't just mean uh, regretting or moving away from a particular negative trait or action. It means constantly moving closer to God. It's not about leaving behind a particular sin. It's about constantly moving closer and closer. So, which is why someone who may be a righteous person could also be a Balchuva. Absolutely. They're always drawing closer to God or trying to. Now, the things you said, Rabbi, were very beautiful. And of course, as you mentioned, these are 
traditional interpretations of of the various uh, parashot, the Torah readings of the month of Elul, allegorical, everything referring to our inner spiritual struggle um, and need to to uh, be honest with ourselves and uh, be better and draw closer to God. And I appreciate all that. However, I do have a um, axe to grind with this whole approach, um, even though I totally subscribe to it. And that is, the fact is that the book of Deuteronomy is Moshe Rabbeinu's preparation for Israel to enter the land. And this is why the book is so detailed, in-depth, emphatic, and, and passionate about what needs to be done when we enter the land, how we need to set up our society, uh, whether it's setting up courts and system of justice, whether it's how we divide the land, whether it's how we treat one another uh, financially, uh, uh, referring specifically to to the Shemitah, the sabbatical year, um, whether it's how we deal with a, an accidental uh, murderer, uh, which is an issue that comes up again in this week's in this week's parasha. Um, Perfect example of trying to establish a just society right. is the city of refuge. The city of refuge, and of course the the Axe Tefer. There are the so Axe many Tefer, unbelievable which is, is things which I was here. Say, which is which is where this like what, what, what we're striving for here is like a is like a, a total different level of a model society. Now, which is why I am always a bit troubled by the personalization of these commandments. And we're, many people will take it and say, you know, it's, it's about myself. It's about me. You know, judges, uh, setting up judges in the gates, that's about me, my eyes, my ears, et cetera, et cetera, my mouth. And so all they personalize it, which is important and, uh, you know, and necessary. But to the extent where the, the lesson for us as a society and as a nation is blurred or lost. And I think that... We're at a time in our history where we really, as much as we need to measure up individually, uh, personally, we really need to measure up and, and do some stock taking as a society and as a nation that even extends beyond the borders of the land of Israel. Uh, because I think that's, we're having trouble with that right now. You know, last week, Rabbi, last week, this past Shabbat in my house, we had a, invited some friends over for Kiddush. And Parshat a and I said a little thing about um, the fact that Moshe Rabbeinu mentions in that parsha for the first time mentions 16 separate times Hamakom, the place, referring to where the Holy Temple will be established. And I talked a little bit, bit about what that means and its significance, its cosmic significance, and why there is a place and why God chose that place and what it's all about. And as I finished, or even before I finished, not just one, but a number of my friends started saying, no, 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 there's no place. The place is inside me. You know, I said, God chooses a place. Yeah, God chooses a place inside me where I, can, where I can be intimate with God. And I said, what are you talking about? But that's ridiculous. These are your friends. I said, These are my friends. Good people, I that's must tell you. That's not an authentic you. Jewish idea at all, what I, I said, I said, but you're, you know, the, it's quite clear God is choosing a place. He's not choosing a place for me and for you. It's completely choosing a place for you. I mean, it's, it's, these are clear references to Mount Moriah. Of course they are. My point is in, 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 in sharing this is that our religion, and I don't even like to call it a religion, but in this context, it is a religion. It becomes, a, you know, you go down the, the aisle of the supermarket and you take this one and you take that one and you pick and choose what you want and how you're going to use it and how you're going to interpret it. Maybe your it. friends do. Well, I don't think it's just, no, don't start on my friends. Well. They're all very good people. They're all... Each one of these particular friends, you know, they left their families and their lives 30-some years ago, came to here, they're good Zionists, they're good Jews, they're wonderful people. But again, people, this is, this is a malady that people, you know, and especially in today's times where everything is about me and I and everything's about consumerism, where, you know, you can cherry pick. Uh, so can I say something? I, w I want to see you and raise you. I want to see uh, yeah, you, you see me and raise, and raise you because there shouldn't be 
any contradiction at all between the two levels because a society is made up of individuals. And I the way agree. I see it is that if there's a double whammy here. In other words, the to Torah is, is obli obligating us to be t so real and to be so completely, um, uh, you know, on the same page on every level. So on the one hand, if every single individual would take responsibility for his own gates yes. and her own gates and, and, and behave in, in the proper manner and set these parameters high and realize who we are and what our obligation is, that would in, in turn contribute a tremendous amount to society as a whole. Obviously, we've been talking for so long about the fact that all of these Torah portions are manifest of Moses gathering his people and preparing them for entering into the land. It's no coincidence that all this is happening as we, as a nation and as a world, all humanity prepares now for the awesome judgment of the new year, which is a time of, of judgment for all humanity and the writing and the sealing of the decree between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And everything here is connected. So no, this is, I don't mean to uh, anthropomorphism out the national and international um, um, you know, implication of, of what is going on here, but everything happens from the ground up on every level. That's how spiritual revolution is created as well as, as, well as social revolution. It's the same thing when we begin to take responsibility. Well, so maybe I'm talking trickle down. Maybe I'm talking trickle down. Maybe I'm thinking if we were to take this month and emphasize our responsibilities and obligations on a national societal level, Exa it would this trickle is exactly down to what our I was saying lives. at the end of the first half. I was saying. The greatest agony that we that we suffer is the fact that the uh, and the anguish that we ask God to relieve us of is the fact that we are witness to terrible perversion of justice mm -hmm. by those in those places exactly of justice. Uh, exactly. So when I was saying that, first of all, so anyway, first of all, have I exonerated myself? I'm not. I you don't, don't have I, to exonerate. No, I'm not I arguing with you, Rabbi. I did not mean God here forbid. to imply that this doesn't that this doesn't. No, uh, I know you. I'm not, I'm not taking that. the verses out of their out of their simple meaning either. But the fact is, it's all it's all happening during this month. We have to take total responsibility inside the house and outside the house. So I was talking about this verse from Ecclesiastes, and that in the place of justice, that's exactly where wickedness is. And I started to say that, you know, we are being held hostage to political correctness, okay? Look what's going on on the Temple Mount. From where emanates the signals, I think, that are, that are basically um, um, <laughs> there's, there's a signal. Mm -hmm being broadcast from the Temple Mount, yes. which is interfering with the broadcast, broadcast frequency mm -hmm. of humanity. Mm -hmm. I believe that we have a new story today that uh, we are posting that yes. of an of a, of a, of um, elderly Jewish woman who made Aliyah from America seven months ago, and today she got, up to go, got to go up to the Temple Mount for the first time, and I think uh, one of the black-clad Muslim dervish women struck her in the ribs, yes. punched her in the ribs, and the police wouldn't do anything about it. Right. Um, in the very first paragraph of Parshat Shoftim, it talks about establishing courts of justice, judges and officers in all of your gates, in your, in, again, allegorically, on your personal level, but of course, for the nation. And then the very next verses say, you shall not plant for yourselves an idolatrous tree, any tree near the altar of Hashem, your mm -hmm. God, that you shall make for yourself. And you shall not erect for yourselves a pillar which Hashem, your God, hates. And you, Yitzchak Ruve, know very well that these verses are talking about a... Um, Mitziyut, an, an actuality on the Temple Mount, that there is right. a prohibition on the Temple Mount of erecting any sort of uh, idolatrous platform or pillar or planting any trees mm -hmm. because of the whole connection guess between what? Asherah, tree worship. So yes, guess what? The, today, the Temple Mount is overrun completely with trees that have been planted very recently as part of the goal of, uh, of uh, Islamic denial to totally change the facts on the ground, to ch totally change the status of Jerusalem, that it would never was a temple, that this is an Islamic site. And it's also overrun with all sorts of idolatrous prayer platforms. But why is this connected to these first verses? Why does it even appear here? Because it is such a microcosm, because that's an example of 
how in the very place of justice mm -hmm. you have wickedness and mm -hmm. we unfortunately and here here's your point exactly and i'm completely subscribing to here we are allowing that we are allowing that not we not you and i right. but uh, as a nation we are allowing that and there's no greater perversion of justice than that um five days ago there was a um stabbing at an ikea store in sweden did you hear about that yeah. It's hard to find out details about it because there's, there's a few different uh, versions and apparently it's not something that is being reported um, uh, c in complete um, honesty. Mm -hmm. um, so there's different versions that we're told about it, but what we do know, there's two suspects. We know that they're uh, Eritrean uh, asylum seekers that were denied, the main, the main suspect mm -hmm. uh, and is from Eritrea, an asylum seeker Muslim who was denied asylum just hours before from this, this board. So he was in Ikea. Everybody knows the Ikea shopping experience. You go in there, they want you to stay. They've got babysitting. They've got, they've got restaurants. It's really, really nice. And everything is set up completely. I've never been you to go Ikea. through all the rooms. What? I've never been to an Ikea. Ne me neither. Cool. You go through all the rooms, <laughs> from what I understand. And they're all set up with the furniture and everything. So apparently in the kitchenwares department, there was knives. Yeah. And this fella took a knife and stabbed a mother and son, killing them. And according to some reports, which of course are not being discussed, beheaded this fellow. But how, is Ikea, how did Ikea react? This is amazing. Ikea issued a statement about, and you know this, and that an Sweden, Sweden's government, Sweden's left-wing government has, has um, created a living hell. Right. with all of these Muslim asylum seekers that are going on there. I don't know if you should call them all asylum seekers. That's uh, Asylum seeker is someone who cannot safely return to their point of origin. Whatever. Whatever. Anyway, IKEA um, issued a statement. You know what they're going to do? They're not going to have these knives out in the kitchenware department anymore. That solves and that the problem. Will, exactly. This is so similar what to... What about chainsaws in the uh, hardware department? Ouch. Uh, what about uh, baseball bats or um, or uh, uh, kneading kneading pins for for dough? They're not gonna they're not gonna have knives out because then that way when a distraught uh, fundamentalist fanatical Muslim uh, has a problem he won't be able to pick up a knife and kill someone. That's always the way to do it. It reminds me of the old joke that we told here in Israel about the dangerous intersection where people were always getting killed because mm -hmm. the intersection was made so so poorly that there were always accidents and people were always having accidents. So what did they do? The authorities they decided they're going to build a hospital right there, really close to the intersection, to make it quicker to get people to the mm -hmm. hospital instead of dealing with the problem. All so right. there is an example of a perversion of justice, which we all are very, very much aware of, and I connected that to what's going on on the Temple Mount because it's the same type of intervention of political correctness. And um, again, there's nothing more painful than perverted justice. You know, there was a... Um, case in, um, I believe it was New York, New York State, Yitzchak, where um, an, a group of families were awarded compensation by a United States court against the Palestinian Authority mm -hmm. in the sum of many millions of dollars yeah. for terror mm -hmm. that was committed by the Palestinian Authority for murderous terror against Jews, Jews that were murdered by members of the Palestinian Authority. Right. The court recognized the Palestinian Authority's responsibility for the deaths of these innocent people the, uh, in terror and awarded them uh, some millions of dollars in compensation. And President Obama himself stepped in mm -hmm. through the State Department and is expressing objection to this ruling because he is afraid that, the, because the ruling is, uh, was of so much money that would be given to the families of, of these victims of terror, that he's afraid that it will bankrupt and destabilize the Palestinian Authority. And because he's so committed to the Palestinian Authority of having this two-state solution, he decided that this is not what he wants, and therefore he stepped in. 
And I don't know what the outcome is going to be. But of course, he never said anything about the fact that the Palestinian Authority has been making payments to the right. families of terrorists and suicide bombers. That was okay. They had the, enough money for that. But when it comes to a judge's decision that they should be able to also make payments to the victims of terror, the President of the United States himself stepped in and said, I don't think that this is what they should do here. So again, from the highest office of the land, you have the perversion of justice. Here we certainly are well aware of the, of the politicization of the High Court of Justice and their agenda when it comes to the demonization and marginalization of various aspects of our society. And this is exactly what our Torah portion is talking about. Mm -hmm. You got it. And it's very painful. And then we mentioned earlier the uh, Egla'ofa, the how do we the Axe Kefir, Ax um, which concludes the Torah portion. And again, this is the uh, I would say the example par excellence of taking responsibility uh, as a people, as individuals, as a community. And this, the incident being described is. Um, the, it's actually called the unsolved murder. The uh, a person, individual, is their, his body is discovered um, outside of a town. Beginning of chapter twenty-one. And um, nobody knows who this person was or or what the story was. It's an unsolved crime. So the Torah rules that the elders of the crime, uh, excuse me, the elders of the town that is closest. And you actually take a measuring stick or a tape measure, or whatever, a GPS, and determine which town is the closest to where this person was found. And those elders have to take responsibility on behalf of that community for this tragic incident. And the actual ceremony takes place um, where they take a, a heifer and uh, uh, break its neck, ax its neck. And, uh, and the elders uh, cleanse their hands and say, our hands did not shed this blood. So by making this statement that our hands did not shed this blood, they're actually accepting responsibility for the fact that it did happen, that something went wrong somewhere. Perhaps this person was in town. Perhaps they, they were turned away from someone. Perhaps they were allowed to leave town on a, in a dark night without... Uh, proper provisions or perhaps uh, they were they should have been encouraged to stay and not leave and not travel at night where it could be dangerous for whatever reason the town even if it was an individual who acted improperly or irresponsibly and that led to this person's death the entire town led by the elders led by the leaders of the community need to take responsibility so here's a uh, an example I think rabbi where Something broke down with all the efforts to pursue justice on the individual basis, on the communal level, on the national level, in the courts. All these levels broke down. Something happened, unaccounted for. Nobody knows what happened, but it was bad. There's a provision here, and, and this, this may even go back to, to the question that, uh, that, that you were asked, that you, they mentioned earlier, that yes, we pursue justice. Sometimes things go awry, and... Uh, horrible things happen and we, we can't explain it. Even in that case, we even after the fact, we need to take responsibility and there is some expression of justice even after the fact when we do take that responsibility. And I think that is probably, responsibility I, I would say is really the key word to pursuing justice, it's the key word to doing that cheshbon uh, nefesh, that uh, in introspection that we do this month. I think it's the word that ties everything together, accepting responsibility, taking resp pursuing responsibility. That's really the on every level. Theme it's of like that's what we were discussing before. There's no mis misunderstanding between us on the individual level and on the national level, and there has to be a complete um, synchronization between uh, the individual as part of the nation and the nation, and really the world, and because it's the world that is facing a judgment this coming. Rosh Hashanah, because we are all the descendants of Adam Harishon, of man, of Adam. And so on Rosh Hashanah, on Adam's birthday, God is reviewing the actions of all of his descendants. And the, and the, and the call of the month of Elul is to really try and um, review what it is that we've been doing, wh where it is that we've been going, and is this what we want to be with, with, with our lives? 
And the basis and foundation of everything is establishing justice in, the, in, this, in this world. And all the pain justice. that we're going through, everything that we see all around us, all the terrible, the terrible perversion of justice, this is exactly what is the, is the, is the negation of the, human, of the divine image that human, humanity was created in. That's what cries out for, for, for mercy. Yep. And uh, that, again, the Parsha starts out with appointing judges in our gates, pursuing righteousness, pursuing justice, and concludes with pursuing justice even when, even when uh, there have been failures uh, in the system. So again, it's the pursuit of justice that is um, an imperative under all circumstances. Uh, for better or for worse, pursue justice, take responsibility. That is the message of the moment, the day, the month, and the season of man. Take responsibility, pursue justice. Thanks for being with us. Temple Talk.